Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman of the Football History Dude Podcast, and I'm stopping by this show real quick to tell you about a couple of cool giveaways that we have going on here at the network. Both are autographed books covering various topics of the NFL. The first is The Point After, How One Resilient Kicker Learned There Is More to Life Than the NFL by ex-NFL kicker Sean Conley. It goes over his unique experience as a walk-on kicker at the University of Pitt after never playing high school football. And then it gets into some of his time playing for NFL teams and so much more beyond the gridiron. The other is from author Kevin Bryant. His book is titled Spies on the Sidelines, the High Stakes World of NFL Espionage. This book started as a curiosity, kind of a passion project to understand everything revolving around well, Spygate. But this put Kevin down a rabbit hole learning about all sorts of espionage that has occurred throughout the history of the NFL. Both permissible <laughs> and often the illicit techniques of gathering intel to try to impact the outcome of the game. To sign up for your chance to win an autographed copy of one of these books, all you gotta do is head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways and sign up. That's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Again, check out all the other podcasts that we have in the Sports History Network as well. But now, back to your regularly scheduled journey to the Sports History Timeline. In this episode, we talk about the largest ever American sporting event disaster that happened at the Cal versus Stanford football game in 1900, where over 20 people perished, and most of the game didn't even know about it until long after the contest ended. We have this story and more coming up in a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day -day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pigpen, your portal to positive football history. And today we're going to be looking back in the portal at maybe an event that a lot of people would like to forget, but it's something, a, a calamity that happened during a football game. And the football game, for some people, it overshadowed what was really going on and they had no idea that such a tragedy was happening. We're going to discuss that in a little bit. Now, when Stanford University and the University of California Berkeley play a contest on the gridiron, it's a big game. In fact, the rivalry has been fondly named just that, the big game. One of these meetings had one of the most tragic in-game situations ever in the history of all sports, let alone football. Now, we had a post in a podcast story on some in-game stadium disasters back a few months ago that occurred throughout football history. And I was reminded of another one recently that I had planned on doing a story on while reading a book by John Behe uh, on Fielding Yost of Michigan. More to come real soon on that and John Behe and his book. But Behe, while telling the story of Yost, takes on a very tragic moment in football history that Yost was a part of, that at least he was at, during the 1900 season, when an overcrowded stadium for a big game between the University of California and Stanford University forced spectators, many of them teenage boys, to climb a roof of a nearby glassworks that would give them a bird's eye view of the playing field. But the rivalry of Stanford and Cal goes all the way back in 1892, just one year after Stanford started admitting students to their school. And the first 13 of these contests were played at the same venue at the Haight Street Grounds in San Francisco. The contest in 1900 would take place on Thanksgiving Day at that very venue, Thursday, November 29th, 1900. The rivalry was entering into its 10th meeting on the gridiron, according to Stanford Magazine, from the December 2015th article by Sam Scott. Now, the story of this 1900 edition of the big game starts with spectators showing up at the gates early at 10.30 a.m., pouring out of train cars and local neighborhoods after rain departed earlier in the morning. The ticket prices to get in were $1 each, but that was kind of steep for many back in that day, especially for local youngsters who wanted to watch a game. 
near one of the end zones of the stadium, there was an adjacent Pacific Glassworks building that sat just across 15th Street from the football grounds. And its roof, with over 40 foot elevation, provided a spectacular free view for those that could not obtain or afford in a ticket to get into the game. The Glassworks was a thriving with work in that time, and so much so that they had workers on staff firing up the large glass furnaces to over 3,000 degrees on a holiday, Thanksgiving Day, inside them, and while the outside temps of the furnace were about 500 degrees. The furnaces were situated in the factory in the center of the bay where the peaked roof designed for ventilation was raised about 45 feet above the brick factory floor. There have been issues in the past where fans refusing to play ticket prices would clamor up the glass roof's roof to watch the game for free. But the plant supervisor, James Davis, had been warned of this and was solicited for assistance by Henry Taylor, the treasurer of the Associated Students of Stanford University. Taylor told reporters that the organizers had provided Davis and company with six complimentary tickets to the game in exchange for keeping people off of their roof. It was probably more from a gate receipt angle than for a safety concern by Stanford. But reports had gone out afterwards that suggested Davis hired security men sanctioned with keeping the roof clear, and they may have used their newfound authority for some ill-gotten gains. Allegedly, reports are that to make some extra pocket change, they were charging people to gain a vantage point of climbing up on a roof. People give them money? Sure, go up on the roof. The very thing they were hired to prevent from happening. The Stanford Magazine story had information from an eyewitness. The article reads that, quote, Herman Geiring, an 11-year-old student at Mission Grammar School, tried scrambling under a fence into the grounds, but was chased away by authorities. He climbed a water tower that was locally there at 14th and Folsom, but that view was obstructed. So finally, he joined the swarm pushing through the most obvious vantage point, the Glassworks Building, unquote. Now, Garing, who survived to recant this story to journalist William Briggs, who was Garing's great nephew all the way in 1968, said there was in fact a watchman there at the glass factory, but quote, but it looks like he was trying to turn back waves at the beach. The kids kept pouring through the fence, anxious to see the kickoff, end quote. There were accounts that the roof ended up having some 400 people on it at the start of the game. Many of them went to the roof's ventilator positioned at the highest point of the peak. It was constructed of thin corrugated roof metal material and it was about 8 foot wide, 72 foot long. And it was engineered to support nothing else but its own weight and nothing more. Some noting that the flimsiness of the vent wisely got off to a more stable portion of the factory roof. We've got a picture from the San Francisco Examiner of the, from the very next day, but they took a shot before that roof collapsed, and you can see the people on it through the goalposts of the field over a wall, and you can see just how many people were on the roof at that time, and that's uh, probably some short time before it did collapse. Now, over across the stadium, the air was electric. The year prior, Cal had handed Stanford a deflating 30 to nothing shellacking, and the Golden Bears fans in 1900 at this game were reminding their rivals of the previous game by wearing hats that said, quote, 30-0 on them. Now, Stanford supporters wore the Cardinal tam which was, quote, the rich red color of life gleamed from the top to bottom of the high bleachers, end quote, according to an account in the local newspaper, The Call. Now, each school's marching band was trying to drown out the other's opposition's musical ensemble, and fans from both sides cheered even louder than usual to try and get their voices heard from over above the musical ensemble battles. Now, this was indeed a fierce rivalry, and needless to say, the stadium was loud and filled with an enthusiastic crowd who was there to watch a great football game. Some 20 minutes into the game, Cal's offense had penetrated deep into the Cardinal territory. The intensity was thick with anticipation, and above the noise of the game, a huge crash was heard just outside the stadium's north side. The spectators strained their neck to look towards the commotion, but could not really gain recognition of what caused it. Then someone in the crowd it decreed that it was just a normal noise from an industrial complex across the street. And the fans seemed subsided by that, and inside the stadium resumed their focus to the playing field and what was going on with those Cardinal and Cal players. Now, the noise that you may have guessed was the ventilator portion of the roof collapsing. Pieces of steel roof panels along with the roof trusses and horrifically, people started raining down on the inside of the factory to land on the estimated 500 degree steel a furnace that was 500 degrees Fahrenheit or on a hard brick floor. 
Glassworks employees at once tried pulling people off the highly heated furnace tops with the long sticks and poles as others tried to turn off the oil supply that was fueling those giant furnaces. About 13 men and boys were declared dead that day at the scene, ranging in age from 46 years old to just nine months old. It had to be a horrid scene as charred bodies were strewn across the factory floor while hundreds of injured survivors were groaning in agony. The stench of burnt flesh and clothing had to fill the air. And there's another photograph from the San Francisco Examiner showing that scene with bodies strewn out of the factory floor and authorities uh, looking over the situation. Across the street, the unknowing spectators witnessed a game that was settled in the final minutes by the first successful field goal in the game's history of the big game. Now, the, at the game's end, hundreds of Stanford fans surged on the field and grabbed a member of the victors and paraded them up and down the nearby streets as ambulances were at the same time carrying away the wounded and dead from the tragedy to Glassworks. And most of these fans coming out of the stadium had no idea what the ambulances were for. Now, it's hard to imagine that people so close to in location could be so euphoric and naive to the situation at hand while others were in utter mourning, states of shock, and just, you know, horrified at uh, what had happened. More than 100 years later, this Pacific Glassworks catastrophe on Thanksgiving Day 1900 is still the deadliest sporting disaster in American history. A total of 23 died from injuries suffered in the disaster. The last of them, some three years later, you know, he was a paraplegic and having other health issues and finally succumbed to the injuries from that dreadful day of Thanksgiving 1900. And of the total, at least 15 of those dead would never see their 18th birthday. The first five pages of the San Francisco Examiner morning edition on, on Friday the 30th of November, that very next morning, were devoted to this tragedy, and rightfully so, in its aftermath. About a week after the event, a jury found no fault with the glassworks and placed the blame of the accident on those that sat on the ventilator roof and climbed up it and either perished or suffered grave injury from the ensuing collapse. Sort of that last insult to the major injuries and deaths that occurred. A sad time in sports history, but one that needs to be recognized because these folks were forgotten about. And it's uh, tragic, you know, 122 years ago, almost to the day, and uh, this tr- horrific thing happened on a holiday and really soured that game and that victory for Stanford. So this is a little bit of football history. It's a sad note, but it is a part of history, and we try to cover it all, of the f- gridiron history especially. If you'd like to hear more, well, we've got about 1,000-some episodes. Just waiting for you to listen to, download your favorite podcast provider here at Sports or at, uh pigskindispatch.com or on sportshistorynetwork.com you can go and find our old files and archives there and uh, listen to some great history also over on Sports History Network there are 27 other great podcasters talking about football baseball hockey basketball and just about any other kind of sport you can think of right there sportshistorynetwork.com till tomorrow everybody have a great gridiron day that's all the football history we have today folks join us back tomorrow for more of your football history We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. just another ordinary day in the offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? 
I ordered it from the Row One website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so Retro it was that Marla Delt discovered the spondiferous magic of Row One Sports memorabilia arts and prints. You can too by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R O W number one today for access to the full Row One catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, Sports Writer, coming soon. Okay,